I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. And this is the I Hate Politics candidate interview with Kristen Mink from Montgomery County Council at Large. If we hate politics, what about politicians? Bring up Congressman Jamie Raskin in southern Montgomery County, and you will see that we only hate politicians we don't agree with. Andy Harris, for example, the Congress member from Maryland's District 1, who saw little wrong with the January 6th insurrection. He is now being challenged by Democrat Heather Mazur. But let us not forget that a plurality of people in District 1 voted him into office. How do supporters of Jamie Raskin and Andy Harris live together in the same state or even the same country? That is the challenge politics is supposed to solve, no less. I'm Sunil Dasgupta, host of I Hate Politics podcast. Rather than your usual candidate forum with 20 questions covering the range of issues and limiting candidates to soundbite answers, the I Hate Politics candidate interview is an in-depth discussion about one issue that the candidate has chosen. If they didn't choose, I chose for them the issue where I thought they were strongest. Well, I'm stuck in my room with too many Zooms, and at first I thought I'll make some bread, but instead I am stuck in my head. My conversation with Kristen Mink focused mainly on public safety. If you don't know Kristen Mink, she is a former teacher and now an organizer for the Center for Popular Democracy and is best known as the Montgomery County mom who confronted Trump's EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt, at a local restaurant. This interview won't answer all your questions about her, but it'll give you a look not only into an issue she thinks is very important, but also to her political thinking more generally. Music for this episode comes from Carol Levchenko, an Arlington singer-songwriter who is the choir director in Centerville High School in Fairfax County, Virginia. Kristen Mink, welcome to I Hate Politics. Thank you so much for having me, Sunil. So we agreed to talk about public security and police reform. Mm -hmm. So let's jump into it. Let's do it. What do you think are the critical public security challenges in Montgomery County today? Well, I think what we're seeing in Montgomery County is reflective of what we see in policing nationwide and have for quite some time, um, which is that our current system of public safety is not one that keeps a fairly large proportion of our community feeling safe and, and being safe. So, you know, we, we're seeing people in the streets, right, nationwide now for intensively over the last year. But of course, this has been ongoing for, for far longer than that. We're seeing a lot more people mobilizing now. Um, and the reason is because people are tired of a system of public safety that really only works for a small proportion of our community. <clears throat> we have black and brown people who feel like targets from our own uh, officers as, as they're walking around. And that is not the kind of community that we want to have. We have police officers who we're holding responsible for responding to basically every kind of incident you could possibly imagine. And even a lot of police officers will tell you that that's not an ideal position for them to be in. You know, here in Montgomery County in Silver Spring, we had a kindergartner who wandered away from his classroom and the response of the school, which was textbook, that's the policy, was to call in the police. And so then we have armed police officers who are trained to respond to criminals going to pick up a kindergartner who's wandered away. And we all saw what happened with that incident at um, East Silver Spring Elementary School. That student was, um, you know, traumatized and abused 
by these adult officers. So I think it's very clear. I mean, from that incident alone, we can see that we clearly do not have a system of public safety that is the best that we could do. We could clearly do better. So we need to be delegating some of those. Um, we need to be delegating those responsibilities to respond to different types of calls to folks who are specialized in those particular areas. Everybody doesn't need to be armed. Everybody should not be housed under the police department. And that's kind of, that's just the beginning. That's just the low hanging fruit. We also need to be putting a lot more money and attention into minimizing the number of calls to 911 that we're getting in the first place. We don't need to be, you know, if we have more people who are housed, first of all, that's gonna lower the number of calls that we're getting, right? So taking care of our community better making sure that people have the mental health resources that they need, the, the jobs that they need, the access that they need to, to different resources, that is going to also minimize the interaction that we have between public security officers and, and the public. So you, in your view, the primary public safety, public security challenge in Montgomery County is around equity, is around the fact that some folks in the county are over policed. Do you see any larger public security issues that goes beyond equity? Yeah, I mean, to be clear, all of the changes and reforms that we're talking about are ones that will benefit everyone. What we're seeing is that um, the failures of the way we have set up our public safety system, the failures of policing, they disproportionately impact um, black and brown people. But having, for example, mental health experts who can respond to mental health crises, that is a system that benefits everyone. So yes, it's an, it's an equity issue, but this is also the reforms and the changes that we're talking about are ones that impact and benefit everyone. Right. So do you see public safety primarily as a policing problem uh, or does the term include other things? And what, other, what are those other things? Yeah, I think when we were talking about um, reimagining public safety, there's kind of two main buckets that we need to look at. One of them is changing who was responding to those calls. And I'm certainly not talking about a situation in which folks are calling 911, right? And there's not somebody available to respond. We, we absolutely need to have people who are available to respond, but we should have more different types of people who can respond, who are trained in, in specialized areas. So that's kind of one bucket. Um, is improving, uh, is expanding what we think of when we think about who can respond to 911 calls um, and improving those. And then the second bucket is investing in community to improve the, the health and well being of our community, to provide, the, make sure that we are providing the things that people need. And that, in and of itself, is going to result in fewer interactions between police or public safety officers and the public, fewer calls to 911. Okay, so let's talk about the response part. Um, mm -hmm. So it is my understanding that over 50% are uh, of police response, um, police calls when they respond are what is described as MO or mental observation, which is mm -hmm. around mental health, right? Mm -hmm. What level, what size of mental health agency or experts do you think is necessary at, for that level of response? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now, in terms of what we have right now, we have around 2,000, it hovers around 2,000 sworn and unsworn officers here in Montgomery County. We have one, <laughs> we have one crisis intervention team who is, who is trained specifically to respond to mental health crises. That is wildly out of sync from where we need to be. Now we have some funding coming in for a handful more, like six more. So we have one uh, in, each of, in each of the districts, but even that is not nearly enough because what we're seeing right now is when we have mental health crises, first of all, that it's the police who are responsible, generally speaking, for calling in those mental health teams, which tells you, first of all, that the police are always the first ones who are there and that we're not you know, saving resources by um, saying that police don't have to respond to every single mental health incident, right? So um, we need to have enough mental health response teams that they can be there as quickly as a police officer could. So we should have, truly, we should have hundreds. Right now, as it is the last report that came out showed that um, only about 10% of the 911 calls were for violent incidents, violent crime, and that included crime against property. 
So we, I think it's very clear that we do not need armed police officers responding to everything and that we need way, way, way more options for folks to call on and for people who can respond. And I was talking to somebody the other day about the incident in which um, that kindergarten student um, from East Silver Spring Elementary School in which that student was responded to by armed police officers, right? And the person I was talking to said, well, you know, the school didn't, didn't have any choice. We don't have any better options. It's not like, you know, we've got police everywhere. It's not like we've just got um, social workers and, and mental health specialists just driving around. Well, we should. That is a policy choice that we have made and we could change that. Correct. But I, what I want to know from you is you use the word enough, mm -hmm. mental health workers. What to you is enough? I think that is where I would like to see our studies and our audits focused, right? So like I said, right now, only 10%, only about 10% of our 911 calls are for violent incidents. And I think that, you know, I don't need to set an, we don't need to set an exact number right now. That's something that's worth doing a deep dive into is how much is enough. Right now, we know that it that we have way, way, way too few. It needs to be enough that we have that we have them available to respond and respond quickly in the same way that our police officers do right now, whenever there is a mental health incident. So, like the audit that was that was just done is looking at how we can change our current system of our our the reforms that we can make within the police department. Right. The conversation that I would like for us to be having is. What is the best way for us, for us to shift resources away from the police department and into other emergency response, crisis response departments, right? What, how much of that funding can we shift and how much do we need to shift in order to have people who can respond to all the, to all the calls as appropriate? Sure, so I understand, but I'm just, I still am gonna press you a little bit on the ballpark mm -hmm. that you're thinking. So if you want a response rate for mental health professionals that is mm -hmm. similar to the police response rate, then conceivably you need 2000, about the same number of police officers as you have mental health. If you have say one fourth of that, then the response rate will be one, you know, um, mm -hmm. one, uh, four times that. So I would imagine that's a, that's a sort of a trade-off size versus how quickly you respond. So in a sense, if, you, if, if your standard is that mental health uh, professionals should be able to respond at, you know, within the time that a police officer responds, then you're talking about, a, you know, 2000 people. Um, so what is that standard? I mean, what, are your, what is your thought about that standard? Yeah, so, I mean, the 2000 number, first of all, assumes that we need 2000 sworn and unsworn officers to be able to respond efficiently to those calls. And I think, that we have more than we, generally speaking, we probably have more than what we What should need. be that number and, then? And if additionally- If 2000 is too many, what should be that number? I, I know you're trying to pin me down on a number, Sunil, No, because, I, because I, yeah. think, I think, I, I'm not trying to, so I understand the difficulty. So I'm not trying to pin you down on a number. What I want to get is your thinking about, you know, if you want to reimagine, what does that reimagination look like? We need hundreds of alternative response teams. And I think that also, you know, that, that as we invest more money in the community, as we're making sure that we're doing a better job providing housing and, and adequate mental health care through the healthcare system, um, you know, addressing food security, putting more money into education, all of those things, right? We will have, we have fewer emergencies to respond to. And additionally, those mental health teams who respond, when we look at, for example, um, in Eugene, Oregon, they have a response team called CAHOOTS, um, a program that they piloted out there and it was so successful, it's now being replicated in various places across the country. Um, what they found is that the people who, the CAHOOTS team, which is um, a pair of people made up of a, a social worker, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, social worker and a, uh, and a medic, and they respond without the police. They can be, they're called in directly by the 911 operators. What we're finding is that the people that they interact with don't have the repeated interactions at the same level that of when folks interact with police officers because those teams are funneling people towards resources and programs that will help them 
that will, you know, that will help them move away from being somebody who folks are going to see as an emergency, right? They're helping people get into housing, they're help, helping people get counseling, they're helping people get the medications that they need, all of those different sorts of things. And so we'll see the same thing too. It's a huge, it's a huge cost saver, and it actually helps people move toward a better life as opposed to just criminalizing. So what is the proportion of the code steam uh, against the police force in Eugene, Oregon? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I'd have to look that up. There was a time when I knew that <laughs> right now is not one of those times, but they, but again, they do have, you know, it's large enough. Now it's a re relatively small um, city compared to Montgomery County, um, but it's large enough again, that they're able to respond quickly. And they always have several, they always have several who are, you know, covering a specific area and able to be called in. All right. Uh, because, you know, if there are successful examples, mm -hmm. then they, if then they provide a you know sort of relative uh, allocation of resource between mental health and mm -hmm. actual police officers, that would be something good to know. Um, yeah, I think that I mean that and, and what you're asking is exactly the conversation that we need to be having like at at the government level and with the community. And you know we have we've had the um, the the committee just that just has recently that just went through and looked at some of these examples, including cahoots, and that's where the focus needs to be is on where you know where those lines where we think as a community those lines should be drawn as opposed to the conversation which is at the county level government right now which is how do we change the police department as it is now as opposed to delegating resources and, and imagining other types of public safety well i mean you can't do one without the other i would imagine in order for the county government to reorganize they are going to have to reorganize the police department as well uh, in, mm -hmm. in the act of delegating, right? You can't not do anything about the police department and delegate, right? That, that's not the way. Yes, that's, co that's completely correct. We do have, as long as we have police officers, we, we wanna be improving what they're doing. That said, if we look through the audit that just came out, a lot of it is about how do we take what we have um, and, and make it like, you know, how do we, be how do we better have the police respond to mental health crises as opposed to how do we not have the police respond to mental health crises? Right. Do you think the audit is specific enough to give us an actual policy um, direction or is it sort of things that are aspirational? Um, neither. <laughs> I mean, I think that there are a few things in there that are, that would be, you know, good reforms to have in place. Like we have, um, you know, like their suggestions around um, improving how, if improving the rate at which invest, use of force investigations are done. Um, however, that was a promise that was made by Mark Elrich several years ago, and we still haven't seen those changes. So I'm not entirely convinced that saying like, we should have these reforms, we should do these things, that that's actually going to result in those changes. And how long are we going to make people wait for those changes? You know, like people are dying right now, people are afraid right now, and we could be doing better right now. Other places are. All of that is true. There is also in liberal Montgomery County, strong support for the police department. What do you say to people that say, oh, police have a very difficult job and they need our deference, not your attacks on them? Yeah, I think that it's not really about deference and attack. We need to be bringing the voices of impacted people and the voices of advocates and the voices of people who are, you know, the police are, are an option that we have. They are a tool that we have, right? But let's hear from the people who they are ostensibly serving. Let's, as a community, really think about and dive into, if you have somebody, if you have a kindergartner who's walking away from school, walking away from their classroom, who do you want responding to that child? Let's start there, right? If you have somebody with a broken tail light, right? What makes the most sense of how we should respond to that? Let's look at these. I think it's important to break it down by particular scenarios and to think about what's, what exactly do we think is the best type of response here, 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 and we do it piecemeal. We do it part by part. If you could define every policing activity, this would be easy. But policing has a lot of discretion. I mean, that is the central problem with policing is that you know, what the police does is very, very discretionary. So it's not as if you can define, predefine every situation, whether it's a kindergarten, kindergartner walking out of school or a taillight or, you know, anything else. The general approach has to change, right? I mean, how many specific situations can you find? And 
in the future, there may be others. I think that that's the best place to start, to be honest, because that's the low hanging fruit. And that's the example that we're seeing set by other counties and cities and what they're doing. Like, um, you know, not you know, for example, there are counties where they are looking at taking police out of routine traffic enforcement. And, you know, that is something that you can break down and, say, and, and, and define, right? So that's something that we could do too. And right there, right there, we're cutting down on so many of the stops that have these bad outcomes and started from these, um, and started from places that were really, did not need to escalate to where they got to, right? So, that, that kind of low-hanging fruit actually is incredibly, incredibly impactful. You know, I, I have a kid who's going to be starting kindergarten in the fall. And as a parent, it's significant to me to know that I want to know that she is not going to be being policed by police officers in and around her school, school building, right? So taking just that piece out and delegating it, that is really meaningful to me as a parent. And I think that this would be meaningful to a lot of other parents as well. You call them low hanging fruit. I do. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> you like that? How I just slipped that in. <laughs> well, well, I'm not sure. I I'm not sure any of this is low hanging fruit. To be honest, I I think the uh, the standards you're setting are really really high. I mean, we have a history of what police means. We have a history of what policing means. There is incredible large amount, large number of support and opposition, I would say, to you know what the police does and how they should do it. I mean, how, for example, take the tra example of traffic, right? Um, traffic enforcement, right? What does taking the police out of tra traffic enforcement look like in real practical terms? What do you think is happening? Who's going to do it? How is it going to be done? Where is the enforcement? Will people listen if there's not a, you know, uh, a police officer wearing a badge stopping them? Yeah, so for example, um, Berkeley is looking at doing this right now. Um, and they are looking at having trained civilians at the Berkeley Department of Transportation be used for traffic enforcement. And that's, and that's pretty well aligned with what we're seeing a number of other cities looking at, is looking at trained civilians out of the Department of Transportation. Okay, so will they have badges? I would assume that they would have badges, yes, because you would want folks to know that they are official and not some Will they wear order. uniform? I mean, we're getting into the nitty gritty, no, no, but yes, I, mean, I would assume I so. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would assume that, that folks who are being pulled over want but, to know that they're being pulled over by someone official. Correct, so if they're wearing uniform and they have badges, then they are, are for all practical purposes for police. Oh, I disagree. I don't think that it's about appearance so much as that it's about are they carrying weapons and are they criminalizing? Are they going to, um, you know, could that end in a in violence, you know, on the part of the of the officer who's pulling over? Right. That's what people are afraid of. Do they are they carrying guns? Are they you know, and are they carrying handcuffs? Is this is this being pulled over for a taillight going to end in me being arrested or handcuffed? That kind of thing. Oh, that's very interesting. So now let's talk, let's talk this through. Right, mm -hmm. so fine, um, you know, you no guns. So it's possible to have police officers without guns. I mean, the British do it, correct? Um, so it's, it's not inconceivable that that can be done. Secondly, if as law, you know, the criminalization part of it is about law, it's not about the police themselves, correct? So you change the law and make it, you know, make it, make that difficult. So do you really need a delegation, another, um, agency to be involved and the creation of another police force, a traffic enforcement police force, if you will, rather than take the department itself and say, no, those that do traffic enforcement don't have guns. And here's to the change in law that says don't criminalize. Okay, that is a great question, Sunil. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, so we're looking at right now, what you're talking about is the difference between reform and really reimagining public safety. And what we have seen is that efforts to reform the police departments, efforts to get them to do things better and differently by, you know, by tweaking the rules that they're governed by internally, um, that that has resulted in the moment that we're at today. Like we've been working on that for decades and decades. And we are at a place where it's totally unacceptable still. Now, so at some point you have to say, how long are we going to continue to try to say, do better, do better, do better, do better, instead of just saying, you know, 
actually there are alternatives and those alternatives make plenty of sense. Okay, so take the, some part of the policing function and take it to another department so that the culture of policing does not right. contaminate. Is that exactly? Good? That's exactly right. Um, because you know, and, and we're seeing examples like, um, uh, for example, the the officer who um, pushed over the elderly gentleman. Do you remember this in DC? Um, mm -hmm. Pushed over the elderly gentleman who you know, and then his his head was bleeding out on the ground. It was really a horrible video, um, and that officer was removed from that unit and. And everybody else on the unit then quit or resigned in protest right. from that officer being being removed. So we're seeing that the culture of policing is such that um, even folks who are, you know, when folks try to do the right thing, when they say like, that was unacceptable, we don't want to have somebody like that doing this kind of work here, right? I'm going to remove them, that it backfires because the culture is such one of, of fraternity there. So you know, again, we've been trying to do this for so long. People are suffering now. There are better alternatives that other places are implementing. We absolutely should be doing, not only doing those things here, but there's no reason that Montgomery County can't be a leader in those things. Like we're looking to Berkeley, other folks should be looking to us. You know, and I just wanted to mention that the audit that was just done, that's looking at um, how we can potentially reform the police department as we have it now to solve our public safety problems, which again, as we mentioned, I don't think that that, you know, we can't be talking about that as if that's the main solution. That's kind of a secondary piece that has to be done. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the framing is very problematic. And the fact that the group that we hired, the organization that we hired to do that audit is made up of primarily police chiefs. So, uh, you know, already, or former police chiefs. So already we know that they're coming in with a particular view around like, let's keep what we have. And in fact, maybe let's funnel in more money for training and more money for this and that, which this is a process that we have already seen doesn't work. It's gotten us to the point where we are today, which is unacceptable. Not only that, one of the people who's, you know, on that board or part of that organization um, is a former chief of police for the Gaithersburg Police Department. Um, which just recently um, murdered Kwame Okran. And I was just talking to uh, his mother and she's really upset, as am I, that we have representation from a former police chief of this police department, somebody who had a hand, right, in developing the culture and practices as they are now, um, who is now part of the organization that is giving advice to Montgomery County on how to make our county safer. So I, I think that it's a very problematic setup that we have now that this conversation um, needs to be shifted and widened to a great degree. Um, and that really goes to highlight the importance of centering the voices of impacted people and community advocates in these conversations, because that's how we're gonna end up getting, uh, getting the best result. Policing and education and anything else really, you know, the things we say, these are moral issues. Right, there's a morality aspect to that, but there's a political aspect to that as well, right? I mean, with, with schools, you know, people have to allocate money from a budget that goes to various places to the schools, as same thing with, with, with policing. There are political actions that, you know, are there and people act politically for and against certain kinds of positions, okay? The, um, resignation of the entire unit after that officer was removed from these police, right? Suggests a political power play, right? And, and they have political power. So it's not as if the opposition folks that oppose you that have a different view of what policing is are without political power. So my question is a political question. You're acting politically, your allies are acting politically, they are acting politically, how is this political, how is this going to be resolved politically? Well, we'll find out in the election, Sunil. <laughs> but I mean, I think really what it is, is folks need to remember that ultimately the political power lies in the hands of the constituents who are doing the voting, right? We have bodies that can contribute money, that can give endorsements, right? The, the fraternal order of the, of the police, right? They can contribute money and funds that are helpful in running a political campaign, right? They have mailing lists that are large, right? All of these, all of these factors um, that can help to push their 
their agenda and help them to elect the folks who are going to support the outcomes that they want. But ultimately, the decision and the power lies in the hands of the voters. And so it is up to us, you know, as a grassroots effort to continue the political, uh, the political education um, to continue having those conversations, to be in the streets, to make sure that we're bringing voters to the polls. And, and the question is, can our grassroots work be more powerful than the fraternal order of police's donations, uh, contrib political contributions, and mailing lists? And I think that they can. I think that is what we're seeing in this movement. We are seeing it happen in other cities and other counties. We are seeing it. And here in Montgomery County, again, like we've said, this is a liberal county. It's a place where people are very engaged. And so I think that absolutely this is an opportunity to make sure that our voters are really informed about the potential here to make our county a leader, to, to, um, to really have a bold reimagining of public safety that benefits everyone and have that be the excitement that's driving people towards the polls. Okay, so let me give you an example. Okay. In the 2020 election, the candidates that ran for a school board, and including me, yes. <laughs> um, those that um, supported boundary change won, right? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the people that oppose bound school boundary changes lost terribly. Mm -hmm. And yet, after the elections, the school board mm -hmm. has said that they are not going to act on boundary change immediately. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. question is, does your election lead to a coalition of public safety reimagination that you're mm -hmm. talking about? And this is why it's so important that we elect not just one or two progressives who are ready to make bold community led changes, that every seat is important. And as we move through this election, it's gonna be important for us to be helping to lift up, not just, you know, I wanna lift up not just myself, but as, but as, especially as we get closer to the primaries, that we're working together with other progressive candidates because we wanna have a powerful block that can really make some bold moves that was gonna work really hard to bring the community, to bring impacted people, to um, bring advocates to the table to help inform these decisions, and that isn't afraid to enact them. You know, I'm running at the county level and I'm not planning for, you know, a state or congressional run. I don't need to pacify voters that are, you know, outside of our area. I'm running for county council because I'm excited about the level of changes that can be made at the county level. That is what I'm excited about. So I'm not going in with political calculations. I'm going in to make some systemic, meaningful changes, right? And I think that there are other people in the race who are there for the same thing. And if we can land a block of us on there and we can really be amplifying those causes, that's what's gonna make the difference between what we can pull off and what we can't. And I think that this is a moment for Montgomery County where this is very doable. And that's what's exciting about this moment to me. So part of, in your, part of your answer that has left me smiling, you know who hates politics most? <laughs> Do tell. Politicians. <laughs> and you yeah. just said, I'm not acting politically, but you have to act politically. You're not exempt from politics when you're, when you're participating in politics. I mean, you can call it whatever you want, Sunil, but I'm going to tell you like what I think needs to be done and how I think it should be done, you know? Um, so, you know, to some extent, yes, everything is politics because people are going to listen to what I say and they're going to decide where to vote, right? But my politics is having these conversations with as many people as possible, because I do think that, our, that my values are aligned with the majority of voters. And that's what makes this moment exciting, that it's about getting to everybody and having those conversations. And that's what's going to make the difference. I think Montgomery County is poised for a grassroots movement that launches progressives into seats of power. You know, we're coming off of a time when there is one woman on the county council. There has never been an Asian American seated on the county council, you know, we're ready for some, they just, they just increased the police budget, right? Like we're at a moment where we're poised for change. Every profession, whether it's policing or teaching or um, professoring, <laughs> yes. want, right? We mm -hmm. want to give ourselves, our profession, mm -hmm. uh, self-regulation. Doctors, for example, for the most part in America are self-regulated, right? Mm -hmm. And so the police, 
want to have a role in the reform that is being imposed on them. Um, mm -hmm. And so what, you know, how you balance that is a really difficult act of politics more than anything else. We need people who are in power who are not afraid to piss off the police, honestly. And, and, I, and I also agree that those voices should be in the conversation, right? But we cannot have them leading the conversation. The conversation must be led by impacted people, by community advocates, because what we're trying to do is solve the problem that impacts them the most. Right. And so it and, and for example, if we look at the state level bill that was just passed and the state level reforms that were just passed, one of the key pieces that was left out was community oversight. And that's a huge missing piece, you know, and, and it's clear why that was left out. Right. Why, of course, the police would want that that bit left out. But what we need is legislators who are brave and strong enough to say, I am going to make good decisions not based on what the Fraternal Order of Police wants for political reasons, but instead because of what is going to benefit the community and the voters. Right, for that reason, is that's the reason I emphasize the politics here, right? Because it is left out the reform folks did not win over uh, you know, the people that control power. At the state level, for example, this, you, know, you have all these new laws in, uh, public safety, but mm -hmm. who is going to interpret those laws? There's a commission on police standards that determines the standards for the rest of um, the, the state. And so they are made up of policing experts, many of them, you know, uh, that are police officers themselves. Just like doctors say, let us self-regulate, just like teachers say, you know, we are professionals, why should police officers not be able to say that? And they do, and they are heard. So it's not a untenable political position is what I'm saying. Because they have tried and they have failed and time is up. We have to prioritize. We have to prioritize the actual safety of the people who they are supposed to be protecting. Okay. That has to be our priority. And I realize that that's politically difficult. This is our opportunity here in Montgomery County to say that we are going to shift our priorities in that direction. Right. So this is by the way, the Jefferson Hamilton argument, right? <laughs> yeah. that, literally the Jefferson <laughs> Hamilton argument, right? That, that you know, that, that people outside the government get to say, uh, you know, what, um, you know, what needs to be done. Um, and, and that's the position that you, you're taking the Jeffersonian position. But there is an equally tenable Hamiltonian position is that once you elect them, and then they serve to for the best, and that experts, uh, that expertise matters, because in the end, police officers have to deliver policing. Police officers are not the best experts on how to deliver public safety to people. And we know that because that's why the streets have been full of protesters. People are scared. We have community members who are scared of the police and with good reason. We have people dying, you know, being pulled over repeatedly, all of these things that are very traumatizing. So the police officers, I feel, have lost the right to be the ones who are the end all be all of what should public safety look like because they're, they're not providing it. We have given, they have had centuries. It's time for something new. It's time to prioritize making change now that actually makes sense, right? And where the, the first question where the starting point is, what is going to keep our communities safest in this situation? in that situation. Let's have that be the starting point because like you said, we can all agree that that's what we want. So let's start the conversation there instead of starting with, well, what are the police gonna let us do? We decide, we decide. Okay, you couldn't be clearer. <laughs> Kristen, man, thank you so much for coming on I Hit Politics. I hope you'll come back. I would love to come back. Yes, absolutely. That was Kristen Mink from Montgomery County Council at Large. You can find out more about her at kristenmink.com. You can follow her on Twitter at Kristen Mink with an underscore at the end. Music for this episode comes from Carol Levchenko, an Arlington singer-songwriter who is the choir director 
in Centerville High School in Fairfax County, Virginia. Bring it in a bucket, Sylvie. Bring it in a bucket now. Bring it in a bucket, Sylvie. Come running, bucket.